Check, 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 check. Hi everyone, good afternoon, good evening, whatever. And uh, I, I'm not going to, those of you sitting at the back, I'm not going to ask you to move forward, you know, sort of. It, it's nicer for the speaker to be able to make eye contact if you sit forwards at the front. Um, but I know none of you are going to get up and move, so I won't persuade you. <laughs> but uh, it's, 
Are you having a nice day? I can't hear. Yes, 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 that's good. Um, what a wonderful way to start the day with a historian and then finish the day with, you know, with Professor Deborah Thomas, an interdisciplinary, uh, you know, ethnographer. Uh, I say interdisciplinary because ethnography is interdisciplinary. And, uh, and she has, she's going to talk about as about the performance, performance, performative, experimental ethnography. I'm stuck on that performative, you know, because, you know, she was a dancer, so I can't help thinking of performative ethnography. You all have a CV. You, you've all been accessing everything online, even here. So I'm not going to read it out. But all I want to do is, you know, let Deborah have the maximum amount of time and welcome her. Would you join me in welcoming Professor Thomas to the stage, please? Um, hello, good evening, and um, thank you, Omar, and um, thank you, Daniel Tucker, for um, hipping us to this amazing network and uh, for the invitation to share with you here. And thank you also, Tamsin, for organizing me and Claire for setting this all up. Um, I really loved listening to the conversation this morning with Lonnie Bunch and so much of what he said toward the beginning of the conversation um, are things I also feel very strongly. Um, one of the things he said was that museums cannot be community centers, but they should be centers of community. And that really resonated with me as well as uh, when he said that museums have to be about today and tomorrow as much as they are about yesterday. So I'm sure you will find some some overlap, even though even if it might not exactly seem like that as we're going along um, this evening. So I want to take you to Tambu Fest, uh, which is a festival that is a kind of a living museum in eastern Jamaica. Uh, but the journey to Tambu Fest uh, requires that we begin by marking violent histories of where we are and with making note of and uh, reminding us of the ongoing conflicts uh, and the contradictions of this land, this water, this air. We are here today on the historic lands of the Lenape peoples, the original inhabitants of the region now occupied by the city of Philadelphia. Indigenous people have lived here for at least 10,000 years. Their ancestral lands, historically known as Lenape Hoking, encompass parts of present day Eastern Pennsylvania, Northern New Jersey, and Southern New York State. During the 1600s and 1700s, the pressures of colonial settler land thefts and other hostilities forced most of the Lenape people to leave their homelands and move westward. Today, Lenape tribal nations include the Delaware tribe of Indians and Delaware Nation in present day Oklahoma, the Nanticoke Leni Lenape, Ramapo Lenape, and Powhatan Lenape in present day New Jersey, the Stockbridge Muncie Band of Mohicans in present day Wisconsin and the Iula Napiwi Lakewit Delaware Nation at Moravian Town and Muncie, Delaware in present day Ontario, Canada. These Americas are built on violence and erasure, and we bring these histories with us, those native to this land, indigenous people from other territories, as well as white settlers by conquest, and those of us who have come here by force or otherwise as a result of slavery, colonialism, imperialism, and ongoing wars. When we enter any room, and especially virtual rooms, we bring these histories into view. So I want to ask, 
ask you to join me in honoring the past, present, and future of the Lenape, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land. And I also wish to acknowledge that the University of Pennsylvania, where I teach, like all of our institutions, was founded upon the exclusion and erasure of indigenous peoples through land theft, deceit, violence, and colonial knowledge production. With the knowledge that we inevitably engage in decolonial work imperfectly and unevenly, we enter and we meet here in the hopes of making a new world. I should also begin by saying that I myself am not a museum worker. Though I work in a museum because the Department of Anthropology is located in the Penn Museum, I do not work for a museum. So I'm what we might call museum adjacent. So to be adjacent is to lie near and to adjoin. And I figure if I'm lying near the museum, I have a responsibility to engage it, if only in order to make sure it doesn't swallow me or those I love while I'm sleeping or even while I'm awake. When I first came to Penn 15 years ago, I experienced the Penn Museum as a constant and ongoing violence. I avoided walking through the galleries on the way to my office, especially the Africa Gallery, because to me it reeked of old ethnographic tropes and all their colonial histories. I felt ill at ease, always cognizant of the ancestors living on the other side of the walls from me. This unsettled feeling sometimes extended to the department where portraits of all previous faculty, which students unaffectionately called the wall of Mancestors, ran the length of the wall outside of my office. Over time, the department has changed and my relationship to the museum has also changed and we did move the portraits. And this is partly uh, the result of programming I've done over the years. Uh, and also due to the really amazing experience we had working with the exhibitions team on our own installation called Bearing Witness, Four Days in West Kingston. And this exhibit addressed the incursion by Jamaican military and police forces into the community of Tivoli Gardens in 2010. Nevertheless, the constant need for vigilance is made evident by revelations such as last April's, a year ago today, actually, that the museum was holding remains from the 1985 bombing by the city of Philadelphia of the MOVE compound. As I share some of my experiences and thinking, I will from the outset state that I believe museums should be for the living. They should be spaces where people can come together to discuss community concerns and imagine possible futures. And while we could all also make this argument about art museums, I should be clear that as an anthropologist, my concern is really with ethnographic museums and with the histories that produced and reproduced them in their current form. For ethnographic museums to be for the living, to be concerned with the well being, repair, and joy of contemporary communities, they must publicly and transparently contend with the histories of violence upon which they were founded. For me, as for many others, and for many of you here, this is preaching to the choir, this is not merely about diversity and inclusion, but it's about transforming the space of the museum and of the field generally from the ground up. A 21st century anthropology and a 21st century ethnographic museum must be informed by and grounded within feminist and BIPOC theoretical frameworks. Scholars and museum professionals must engage this work and build conversations out from it in ways that are relational and durative, and in ways that decenter Western imperial modes of ethnographic authority. As we all must know by now, decolonizing is neither a metaphor nor an event. It's not an accomplishment, something that can be completed and put behind us. It is instead a committed practice, a set of processes that enact ongoing forms of accountability and responsibility. And I said it that way to, um, to cite Avery Gordon, a, a sociologist who talks about the ability to respond, so responsibility um, for the violences that structure our institutions. So now that you know what my punchline is, 
Uh, let me back up and also say that while the current moment is explicitly and has been explicitly one of reckoning, it's also true that from the very beginnings of the discipline of anthropology in the 18th and early 19th centuries, which is when evolutionary hierarchies, uh, hierarchies of race were developed by anthropologically oriented physicians, and throughout the discipline's institutional elaboration in the late 19th century and throughout the 20th century, anthropologists, political activists, and cultural workers have responded to each and every denigrating screed. This was true not only in the United States, where Frederick Douglass responded critically to Samuel G. Morton and other proponents of polygenism, but also further afield, such as when Haitian diplomat and anthropologist Antenor Fermin countered Arthur de Gobineau's essay on the inequality of the human races with his own text, The Equality of the Human Races. As more Black and Indigenous scholars entered the discipline of anthropology or became museum practitioners, there's been a concerted effort to grapple with what Amy Lone Tree has called, quote, the legacies of historical unresolved grief by speaking the hard truths of colonialism and thereby creating spaces for healing and understanding, end quote. This has entailed processes of rethinking not only our theoretical, uh, our theoretical groundings, but also our methodologies. Volumes such as Decolonizing Anthropology, Moving Further Toward an Anthropology for Liberation, which was published in 1990 by the Association of Black Anthropologists, and Linda Tuiwai Smith's Decolonizing Methodologies, Research and Indigenous People, which was published in 1999, encouraged all anthropologists to interrogate the relationships of power and the forms of representation that are embedded in our practice. These scholars were urging anthropologists and museum practitioners alike to think about who owns research and whose interests are served by it. Today, we find ourselves in what Christina Krebs has called an age of engagement. And here she's referring to the ways museums and the discipline of anthropology have begun to respond, quote, to pressures to be more socially relevant, publicly engaged and accountable to diverse communities, end quote. Within the field as a whole, there are new collaborative calls for institutional frameworks that center people over profit, that sustain through community buy-in rather than philanthropic buyout, and that prioritize connectivity over critical mass. And uh, here I'm, I'm paraphrasing Nico Whedon, whose um, new book that's just out, Museum Metamorphosis, is, is really a, a must read, not only for its interventions, but also for its method. It's a series of conversations, right? Uh, Whedon's premises are that we need to move beyond a consumer capitalist framework in order to ignite the radical creativity needed for transforming museums that the process of this transformation is slow and iterative and necessarily cooperative, and that museum scholarship should be decolonized in order to liberate the museum from being a space of enclosure so that it can engage contemporary social justice concerns. While these conversations are compelling and robust, we see at the same time, at least with respect to ethnographic museums, a new phase of the so-called culture wars with some scholars calling for abolition, while others issue defenses of an older view of anthropology, one that imagines itself to be objective and objectively rigorous, and it recycles an unselfconscious privileging of enlightenment modes of knowing um, of a, and a, a glorification of future scientific potential over present day community well-being. It also signals a resistance to the forces of responsibility and accountability. So in the face of this backlash, I wanted to offer a few interventions in which I've been involved in order to think about what is possible from the space of adjacency that might be more difficult to enact from a position directly within museum infrastructures and also to make an argument for the importance of artists and artistic work in institutional transformation. So first, I wanna talk about uh, the conference that I had begun planning 
in the before times, right, years ago, uh, with the former director of the Penn Museum, Julian Siggers. So this conference titled Settler Colonialism, Slavery, and the Problem of Decolonizing Museums was postponed twice due to COVID, and it finally took place last October with our new museum director, Christopher Woods. We wanted to create space with this conference to build on some of the conversations, the issues being raised within Europe and within South African contexts, while also thinking through the particularities of the view from the United States. Drawing from the insights of scholars and the experiences of museum practitioners and educators, we sought to join the conversations related to settler colonialism to those related to slavery and imperialism. And we also sought to chart a terrain that emphasized multivocality and multimodality, and that imagined the kinds of collaboration that might be possible between European, North American, South African, and other stakeholders. And finally, we wanted to elaborate new forms of relationships that museums might have with their audiences. One panel dealt with the place of the United States in relation to global imperialism, particularly with respect to how the dual histories of settler colonialism and slavery have influenced collection and exhibition practices. Another panel addressed the ways NAGPRA legislation impacted the development of legal processes for repatriation and other forms of reparation, and how North American museum practitioners would need to move beyond NAGPRA in order to also grapple with questions of imperialism and slavery as we think about meaningful processes of repair. We also showcase some successful processes of decolonizing, indigenizing, and anti-racism, including initiatives like Museum Hue and processes at the Field Museum in Chicago and the South African National Gallery in order to think about how particular the processes might be applied to other contexts. In the evenings, we hosted two roundtable discussions, one of which convened Black biological and bioarchaeal bioarchaeological anthropologists who have extensive experience with community driven research repatriation and reparation processes. And the purpose of that roundtable was to glean what lessons the African American burial ground process in New York might offer for the Penn Museum as it contends with the repatriation of the Samuel G. Morton Crania collection. The other roundtable discussion featured graduate students who worked under a kind of loosely organized critical museum studies group. And they were thinking about the connections between museums and universities on one hand and global histories of slavery and colonialism on the other about how we visualize and represent the scale of collecting and trading in human bodies without recapitulating trauma and violence and about how we might formulate tours in the museum that would acknowledge these histories and that would also direct attention to the labor and contributions of indigenous folks in producing the objects and knowledge on display. Finally, we screened a couple films and uh, we commissioned South African artist Coral Bijou to do a participatory talk shop. She called it a talk shop, not a workshop. Um, and it was part collaborative performance, part play, part meditation. And all of this happened over Zoom. So if you're interested in hearing any of these discussions, they are available on our conference website. If you just go to that panel that says view conference. Um, and this website was actually built by students in my intro to cultural anthropology class during the fall 2020 semester. Our hope was that throughout the conference, panelists and audiences alike would allow themselves to become something akin to what Ruth Behar has called vulnerable observers. But Behar sees anthropology as a disturbing yet necessary form of witnessing, the central dilemma of which has to do with our own positionalities as researchers. How do we deal with our own involvement with our material? How do we write relationality into ethnography, into ancient DNA research, into historical archaeology? 
In what ways do we analyze our implication within global geopolitical and historical processes of inequality? How are we complicit in reproducing these processes and how might we work to transform them? So Behar is calling for us to risk exposure. Um, and this, this sensibility of risk taking is something that she feels has to be ongoing, right? Museums cannot be safe spaces unless they work in ongoing ways to repair the various forms of harm that are embedded in their histories and their presence. And central to this repair work, as I've already mentioned, is transparency. So I wanna shift for a moment to talk a little bit about pedagogy. Uh, before the COVID-19 pandemic began, we had begun talking in our undergraduate committee meetings about how to introduce students to a field they haven't heard about before, because as you all are sure, I mean, I, as you know, I'm sure, um, anthropology isn't typically offered in high schools. Um, so how could we do that and also in creative ways get them to think about how knowledge is created and how that knowledge is both solidified and also challenged over time. Um, so undergraduates who do have some understanding of what anthropology is or who have been exposed to it a little bit or tangentially as university students tend to think about the field as the study of other people. So to destabilize this expectation, we decided that I would retool our introduction to cultural anthropology course in a way that reflects the ways I've always actually taught the course. Um, and by that, I mean that I've, I've, I've always uh, read and taught against our canon uh, in ways that really expose the colonial underpinnings of our discipline, even when teaching the classics, right? So the new course, Anthropology, Race, and the Making of the Modern World, would be explicit about its critical inquiry. And what I ultimately wanted them to take away from the course was a sense that anthropology should not be about other people, right? It should be oriented toward generating a better understanding of how power has worked in the past and in the present, and how this power is related to both what we know and how we know what we know. And on top of this, I wanted to design the course as a project based course um, and you know that's usually something one might do in a seminar, but this is actually a large lecture course, so this has required some creative um, thinking. So there are several goals for this class, the first is that students would come to understand the foundations of capitalist modernity as the twin processes of indigenous dispossession and genocide and African dispossession and slavery, and that they would think about how these foundations shape our knowledge and appreciation of human difference, as well as of the political mechanisms through which inequalities are produced and reproduced and challenged. The second goal was that students would learn the various approaches anthropologists have had toward the concept of race and how these have developed over time. Third, students would come to an understanding of the issues involved for museums in terms of collecting, exhibiting, and research vis-a-vis uh, -vis objects acquired through and as a result of native dispossession and imperialism. And then they would also learn about how people in a range of museum and academic contexts have worked toward repair and repatriation. And so to do this, they're working on a project throughout the entire semester. And as I just mentioned, the fall 2020 project was building the website for our conference and they made lots of amazing things. They did annotated bibliographies of all of the presenters and scholars. They made playlists, they made video playlists, they had resource lists, they did a timeline of repatriations from the Penn Museum. They did a lot of research to sort of come up with a, a website that would not just be a conference website, but also a resource guide in some ways. This past fall, the students conducted research for and built an exhibit at the slot gallery called Rotten Foundations, Dangerous Footholds. This was a series of demonstration projects confronting scientific racism in institutional spaces and, uh, as my TA gave us the subtitle, the process of unbecoming human. 
Emerging in the early 19th century, scientific racism served to legitimate the white supremacy that legitimated, that undergirded European exploration, indigenous dispossession, and African slavery. By the late 19th century, this ideology came to be institutionalized at what is now the Penn Museum in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Pennsylvania. But Penn was only one of several scientific institutions across Philadelphia, including the one next door, where the so-called science of race and theories of polygenesis were elaborated. These theories, promulgated by physicians like Samuel G. Morton and Penn anthropologists Daniel Brenton and Carlton Kuhn, were built on the bodies of indigenous and African descended people who were collected, researched, and exhibited as objects among other objects. Our exhibit was designed to be a series of experiments in how we might challenge conventional ethnographic modes of looking and representing culture and otherness. If capitalist modernity was grounded in conquest, expansionism, and genocide, then we asked, how do we account for the ways Enlightenment science continues to structure our thinking about race and difference? How can institutions reckon with these histories and how might we create the conditions to confront our complicities with these histories? If we understand that the way we treat the dead reflects our value of the living, then how must we be accountable both to the dead and to the living? And how do we work toward repair and justice? So the students began this whole process of developing this exhibit by um, elaborating a series of statements and messages to undergird the work. Um, so these were some of the statements. Scientific racism emerged from the modern historical processes of imperialism, settler colonialism, and slavery. Scientific racism creates the conditions for disavowing the histories that brought it into being. Scientific racism leads to dehumanization. Scientific racism causes us to willfully misrecognize each other. Scientific racism makes, it un makes us unable to relate to the land that we inhabit. And the, the proactive statements were, we need to develop new ways to see each other. We need to develop more caring practices in and beyond institutions. We need to consistently educate ourselves and others about the histories undergirding global white supremacy. And we need to organize to undermine scientific racism in all its guises. So the students were broken into groups, each of which was charged to create something that would help visitors acknowledge and recalibrate their own understanding of the histories and potential futures of ethnographic museums. They were interested in developing ways to reclaim erased histories, histories and memories, dispelling colonial forms of containment so that ancestors past, present, and emerging could rest. I'm gonna talk about a few of the projects, the demonstrations that they developed. So one was a land acknowledgement that tethered uh, students' understandings of the local histories of indigenous dispossession um, that were tied to the founding and development of the city of Philadelphia, which meant also necessarily engaging with contemporary dispossessions of African-Americans due to university expansion. Another group developed an interactive audiovisual aug augmentation of the written land acknowledgement, some of which was incorporated into a video project. I'm gonna show you just a very, very short clip of it in a minute. And this video project um, was developed by another group that used 3D scanning applications to feature digital life casts of some of the students, as well as of the Penn Museum classroom that was once used to hold uh, ancestors who are part of the Samuel G. Morton Crania collection, and also archival uh, materials that was detailing uh, information of particular ancestors and read out some of the correspondence between Samuel G. Morton and his um, collectors. I think you're going to get the video now. I and acknowledge that the University of Lenin Lenape occupies the Ramapo Lenape and Portion Lenape and the Munsee Thank you.
So uh, we also built a grid of life masks, which were casts of the students' faces. And these were accompanied by QR codes that when scanned would allow visitors to see contextualizing discourses that the students created about themselves. And a side note on this, and some of you probably know this anyway, but uh, the casting of faces became part of physical anthropology at around the same time uh, as photographic technologies were developed, so mid late 19th century. And both French and German physicians and physical anthropologists really pioneered these technologies within their colonial empires. That's me in the middle getting cast. Uh, the Dutch also created casts of people in their colonial territories and ethnographic museums began to receive and buy anthropological casts in order to tell the story of human evolution. Uh, and that's my face. Uh, casts are in the main imaginative reconstructions of earlier hominids and, and also stereotypical representations of racial groups, right, so-called types of mankind. So the students were responding to these kinds of histories and also asking these kinds of questions. What would it mean to humanize and contextualize physical remains? And if someone were to make a cast of you, what kind of contextual uh, information would you want to accompany it and in, in what form? So some of them, uh, if you went to the QR code, some of them had like picture family pictures or pictures of their pets or playlists or their favorite movie or you know things that uniquely made them them uh, another group created a wall of refusal or casts without features through which visitors were invited to confront agential opacity the refusal to be seen and known to be captured and confined by western categories and hierarchies so the students who didn't want to have their faces cast for whatever reason some students were worried about what it would do to their skin some students got like totally claustrophobic and didn't want to continue um, so they were then interviewed about why they didn't want to cast their faces and those interviews were available by scanning the qr codes so with this um, demonstration students really wanted visitors to confront their desires to make visible which was that which was deliberately being held from view uh, another group did a series of interrogations of human evolution and human remains policies um, these two groups used both conventional and abstract images and also enlarged photographs of their own body parts uh, to probe questions like what are the effects of decontextualization of body parts from the whole human of humans from their cultures and histories right? how have exhibits of decontextualized human remains reinforced a narrative of racial progress toward European civilization and in what ways can we challenge these forms of dehumanization uh, we also created a so-called bone room in which visitors were confronted with a collection of paper mache crania. So there's us making the crania. Uh, and they were invited to try, visitors were invited to try to categorize these crania according to their visible traits, which in any case was impossible because of how they combined the quote unquote traits that they developed. So here they wanted to ask how the very act of categorizing dehumanizes and reifies visible differences. Uh, so another historical side note, uh, in the early days of physical anthropology and medicine, anthropologists and anatomists amassed these skeletal collections to use them for research and teaching, um, but they were also used to really solidify racially codified understandings of human evolution and quote unquote progress. Right. So within ethnographic museums, these collections are sometimes are called in what is are, are held in what is colloquially called bone room. So that's why we called it our bone room. Right. And crania became particularly important to physicians and proto anthropologists like Samuel Morton, who in the 18th century developed a kind of system of measuring particular traits like skull size and the size of particular features or openings in the skull in order to hierarchically uh, 
uh, categorize these materials into into racial groups, right? So today there are over 10,000 individuals or pieces of individuals in the Penn Museum. And this is true across the country in institutions like the Peabody Museum, the Smithsonian Museum, the Smithsonian Institution, the American Museum of Natural History in New York, as well as various other natural history museums, but also in zoos, um, as uh, a lot of the zoological research that was taking place in zoos also um, was conducted on indigenous ancestors. Uh, finally, a group of students created a series of action and advocacy possibilities, as well as a reflection wall, and here's the reflection wall, through which visitors were encouraged to put to paper what they learned from the exhibit and to get involved with activities taking place on campus within the city of Philadelphia and nationally. So at the opening of the exhibit, we also screened a documentary film that was developed by two undergraduate students who worked with me during the summer of 2021 called uh, The Controversial Carlton Kuhn, Legacies of Scientific Racism in Anthropology. Kuhn was a professor in the anthropology department in the mid 20th century who advocated a theory of multi-regional evolution. And this is the theory that had been used to support slavery when it was first elaborated by Morton. And in Kuhn's version, it was used to support Jim Crow policies. To make the film, the two students did a kind of crash course in filmmaking with a colleague of mine in the design school. They read Kuhn's work and other critical research about his theories and their effects. Uh, they prepared for and conducted interviews via Zoom with leading scholars in the field, including Monique Scott, who I see is here. Um, and uh, these interviews were about the history of, anth of physical anthropology, the importance of Penn and Philadelphia as sites for the elaboration of scientific racism, and about what can be done to repair these histories. So they did archival research, both in the Penn Museum uh, archives and with materials uh, collected from the National Anthropology Archives at the Smithsonian. And they edited these various materials into a 39 minute film. And I should say that they did all of this virtually. They were not in the same location. So they were editing together online, basically. So the exhibit and the film were both meant to publicly and critically interrogate the histories that we inhabit here at Penn, in Philadelphia, and in the United States, and in the West. We unearthed these violent histories in order to create spaces for dialogue. Right? We understand the kinds of archives in which we live and work so that we can develop caring and ongoing forms of repair. So my own research and artistic practice, which is based in Jamaica, which is where my father is from and where we spent my early childhood, has also been focused on creating and assembling archives of violence. I've been interested in using these archives to generate difficult conversations about the relationships among personhood, politics, and violence, and to create spaces where people can connect with each other across time and space. And by space here, I mean geographic space, yes, but also generational space and sociocultural space or political differences, right? In order to think about their relationships to these archives, to these histories, and to together elaborate forms of care and liberation. So this has meant working with existing archives, uh, which are difficult because they're usually colonial or otherwise surveillance, but it has also meant developing new archives. And these new archives for me have been narrative, they've been performative, sonic, visual, and for me, archiving in this way has been a decolonizing practice. So while my focus has been on moments of state violence that have been forgotten or that have been disavowed in various ways, in the films that I've made uh, and in the exhibit that we produced at the Penn Museum and in my writing, the purpose has been to create different affective relationships to violence. And I've written about this as a practice of witnessing 2.0 which I've defined as a quotidian practice of watching, listening, and feeling, uh, feeling with 
that is relational and profoundly intersubjective. So witnessing 2.0 is a moral and an ethical practice that involves exploring our implication within contemporary events, therefore our various complicities, um, and having the ability to respond, right? Response ability. Witnessing 2.0 makes visible how material, ideological, and affective space times operate in multiple temporalities and across levels of consciousness. It's a practice of recognition, and it's also a practice of love that destabilizes the boundaries between knowing and feeling, complicity and accountability, and it's a practice that potentially reformulates the ground of the human itself. So for me, this is ultimately the affordance of both ethnographic and artistic work or, or socially engaged artistic work and uh, the creation and assembling of archives that can really generate meaningful forms of relation and repair. So as much as I've been concerned to develop archives of violence, I'm also compelled to uh, elaborate archives of what Kevin Kwashi would call aliveness. So anti-Black violence is, of course, not something that has only recently developed, and people have always created spaces in which they can refuse the terms of this violence and where they can generate love, care, alternative modalities of reckoning personhood and alternative formulations of community. So one of the things that I've been working on over the past few years with my friend and collaborator, Junior Gabu Wedderburn, is a project called Bush Music. And this has spawned a number of things, including an annual Kumina festival called Tambu Fest. And so, yes, we're finally getting to Tambu Fest. So Kumina is both a sacred and a secular tradition in Jamaica that involves drumming, singing, movement, and other ritual elements like sacrificial offerings, depending on whether a ceremony is being held to commemorate a birth, a death, uh, a wedding, the anniversary of a death, or if it's being held to heal or support somebody in the community, or if it's held being, uh, or, or if it's being held to connect with ancestors or to uphold obligations to ancestors or for any other reason. Kumina emerged from the practices of indentured laborers who were brought to Jamaica from the Congo region of Central Africa after the uh, abolition of slavery in 1838. And it's currently practiced primarily in the parishes of uh, St. Thomas and Portland, which are both on the eastern end of the island. But during the period of plantation slavery and in the post-emancipation era in Jamaica, ritual practices like kumina, which had been denigrated, uh, which were denigrated by colonial authorities and in part they were denigrated because they served as spaces for communion gathering and elaboration of counter hegemonic worldviews among poor black Jamaicans. Today Kumina communities are often small family based groups and uh, sometimes these are called nations or bongo nations and they're led by a queen or a king. And the rhythm of kumina drumming is the foundation of naibingi chanting um, and, and naibingi drumming is really the root of reggae music so you can see a line between kumina and contemporary popular um, popular music in jamaica so the counterclockwise dancing in kumina is driven by the drums and marked by the singing and it's really meant to, to generate possession or what we call maya and this heralds the return of ancestral spirits. So what is really emphasized in Kumina is continuity, right? The dead are not dead, the past is not past, the here and now is also the there and then, as well as the possibility of something else to come. So Kumina was one of the cultural practices elaborated by artists and intellectuals in Jamaica as part of an anti-colonial agitation in the mid 20th century that was oriented toward the development of an awareness of Afro-Jamaican cultural traditions. And this was part of an effort to dislodge the sensibility that European cultural practices were superior to those originating within Africa and to socialize newly independent Jamaicans into an appreciation of these practices by making them the basis of a national cultural identity. 
Kumina groups became recognized by branches of government like the Jamaica Cultural Development Commission and school dance teams would learn how to perform Kumina dances as part of the National Festival of the Arts, which takes place every year around independence. Organizations like the National Dance Theater Company of Jamaica and LACADCO, which is a Lantonette Caribbean dance company, would celebrate and elevate Kumina to the concert dance stage, and they do that in slightly different ways. Um, and today, revitalization projects are afoot. So Junior has been working to reintroduce songs that had originally been recorded in the 1960s and 1970s by pioneering Jamaican cultural researchers like Marjorie Wiley, Cheryl Ryman, and Monica Schuler. But some of these songs have fallen out of the sort of regular practice and, and repertoires with uh, contemporary practitioners. So he's trying to reintroduce some of these songs back into um, today's practice. And he's also been recording elders. And together, we organize this festival, Tambo Fest. So this is a festival that's part community funday, part reasoning, part kumina, and it's really designed to bring people together in community to reflect on issues that are important to the community as a whole and to chart new futures explicitly and unconsciously through the portal of kumina and the relations that it brings into being. So I'm going to show you a promo clip that was edited by Farah Rahman, who along with Gordon D. Asa and Joel Powell also shot the footage. Um, Farah and D are graduate students at Penn. Well, D has just graduated. Um, and there are graduate students who are involved in an organization called CAMRA, C-A-M-R-A, which is the, cult, uh, the, the collective for the advancement of multimodal research arts. So CAMERA is the graduate student counterpart for our uh, Center for Experimental Ethnography, which I direct. So I'm going to briefly say a couple of words about the center, and then I'll show you the clip. So the Center for Experimental Ethnography was founded in 2018 to promote multimodal research practices as both theory and uh, integral, as both method and theory, as integral dimensions of research. Right? We're, we're trying to make the argument that creative practice is research, um, that, uh, that this is a process that, um, that, that conducting research multimodally is a process that necessarily transforms the relationships that we have with each other, transforms how we teach, transforms our relationships with our students, and therefore it transforms the process of knowledge formation within the institution. So we're kind of trying to turn uh, the institution bottom up. So we coordinate scholarship, research, and public partnerships that are related to multimodal research practices, such as this organization and the program that Daniel Tucker runs. Uh, we consolidate the activities that our students and, and that our faculty are involved in already, and we grow these connections by hosting, visiting scholars, by coordinating workshops and conferences, and by supporting uh, multimodal project-based courses. Um, so a basic premise that underlies our efforts is the contention that an expanded and multimodal definition of what counts as scholarship uh, will help lead to a more diverse university community and a community in which artistic practice is a cornerstone, not only for engaged and participatory social justice work, but also, as I said, for reimagining uh, the university as a whole. So now to the clip. Carl Grande, yo! African people! Two, 
me a new colliptus now. Carl Grandi, yo. Me a go Carl Grandi. So I want to talk for just a second about um, what I love about this clip. So first, it really captures the energy of a community event, um, one that features a practice with which attendees are likely familiar, um, but they may not be actually involved, but in which they nevertheless take part because it's what's going on in the community on a Friday or Saturday night. Um, I also love that it's doubly mediated. And by that, I mean that our students are filming it, but they're also filming other people who are filming it, right? Which I think is um, so telling about how we sort of experience um, the world uh, these days and that everybody is making their own media about the festival, right? Um, and finally, uh, as a former professional dancer myself, I love that the women are seated in the beginning. And when they're seated, you can kind of see the kernel of what the movement is even before they get up um, and even as they're resting. And that what propels them to rise up is that that little kernel grows and grows and grows and grows until sitting can't accommodate it anymore. Um, and, you know, I think that these kinds of practices and festivals and community gathering spaces are just are, are living spaces and they're living spaces that celebrate and honor the past and the present and the future resources of the community. So for us, Tambu Fest is a way to practice a kind of radical sovereignty, which is something that scholar Laura Harjo defines as a set of everyday community-based practices through which people recognize their own power to act and to self-determine. A multimodal and multi-spatial sphere of energy, relationality, and decolonial love that creates the conditions to imagine a futurity that is not enclosed in the infrastructures of governance or management or museums or universities. The Tambu Fest, like other community-based spaces of care, uh, creativity, spirituality, it, it really insists on both reflection and joy. Right? It insists on circularity rather than linearity, um, on accountability to each other, and on the transparent engagement with our histories and our future at one and the same time. Um, and that is what I will leave you with. Thank you very much. I don't know if people have questions, if we have time for questions. Thank you, Deborah, if I may. That was inspirational. And uh, I, just, I think two messages that come out strongly is for those of us involved in research and so on, that interventions through students and their creativity is one of the best forms of transformative learning. And the second thing is that uh, with the intangible heritage convention of UNESCO, so much is being frozen in time, and yet you've given examples of how, how the time of first actually shows uh, that cultures are living, they're dynamic, they're adapting like everyone else as we go along, along and how we capture them. I have three comments before I hand over to the audience. Mm -hmm. First thing is, having worked in South Africa from 94 to 99, the one thing that hit me very hard going from work in India and mostly Australia is that the paradigm shift in South Africa. In India, Australia, you know, the colonized, the blacks were, or the tribal in India are minorities. And uh, whereas in South Africa, they're the majority. And this made a big difference in terms of power. You refer to power relations. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. Uh, it took us, and I've always played a role in this, 
from November 1989 to about July 2009, in fact, during the Inclusive Museum Conference in Brisbane, to get an Aboriginal committee, to, you know, to advise the cabinet on return of human remains. You know, that, that's how long it took. In South Africa, it took us three weeks because Mandela wanted it. You know, and Mandela is the leader of the majority. He wanted it. So that power relations is one thing. Second thing is the witness. You use the word witness. And during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, during chaired by Bishop Desmond Tutu, Derrida was there. And Jacques Derrida, you know, listened to the whole thing. Then he gave this exposition that the challenge really for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is the real witnesses are gone. Mm. They're not there. Mm. So how do you, who are the witnesses? And uh, so I, I, I think apart from those two, and I'm sure you're quite familiar with the controversy centering around Pippa Scottness's mm. exhibition, Miscast, um, and Miscast of the San people in the South African Museum presented in the National Gallery of South Africa during that euphoria of forced apartheid, euphoria of democracy, caused a lot of controversy for one simple reason, not that people, people's ideas was, was not accepted, but there was no first voice of the San people. So we had to convene a special seminar for San people to express their pain at their past being represented by somebody from the Caucasian community or in South Africa, white. And uh, so it was, a, you know, when, when casts are made, when interventions are made, how does one deal with the first voice of people or their descendants? Mm -hmm. I mean, these are three basically comments. If you wish to comment, that's fine, yeah. but I wanted to share with you. Um, sure. I mean, I think one of the reasons the engagement with South Africa is so interesting in different ways, um, you know, a lot of people, I think, um, think through uh, a connection between apartheid and segregation, which is absolutely true. But South Africa is one of the only other places outside of the United States that have these dual histories of um, indigenous dispossession and slavery, right? Cape Town was the center of the Indian Ocean slave trade. And, um, you know, the European conversations about restitution are conversations about imperialism that don't necessarily have uh, as robust a thinking about indigeneity. Right, or indigeneity as it is defined within the spaces that they've colonized. So I think actually the connection with South Africa is, is very important to, to think with. On another sort of, you know, in my other kind of theoretical mind, um, also to think this, the, the relation between South Africa and the Caribbean has been really um, fruitful for me and, and for others because we tend to reckon diaspora and the African diaspora through West Africa. And um, being in South Africa and, and sort of moving through with friends of mine who are artists or filmmakers or um, activists in different ways, I think we really got the sense that um, if we reckoned diaspora from Southern Africa rather than from West Africa, it would make us see different things, right? And one of the things it would make us see is, uh, or, or I guess one of the things that would destabilize is this idea that's a temporal idea, you know, that there's a, a movement away from Africa toward the Americas. And so Africa is origin and the Americas is, is the new setting and that the things that are dynamic happen in the West, right? But if we instead think about the connections between Southern Africa and South Africa in particular and the Caribbean and the United States, in fact, we can't position we can't um, we can't make those kind of origin stories in that same way. So it really troubles this idea that Africa is past and that what we are now is something else. You know, so I've, I think it's it's been really important both for um, like um, decolonizing museum processes, but also decolonizing certain theoretical ideas that become dominant um, in certain spaces. Yeah. 
Um, I think we have time for one great question. <laughs> no <laughs> a pressure. A few small <laughs> questions. Uh, no pressure. <laughs> I mean, if anybody's going to be in Jamaica at the end of July, yes. you should come to Tambo Fest. Um, well, so I have a kind of a pedagogy question, Deborah, which is that, so in a class like the one you were describing where you did this slot exhibit, um, you're sort of, there, there seems to be there, there's a lot that's being introduced right there's a there's the sort of uh you know the kind of critical and theoretical framework to even get to make the projects right the land acknowledgements or the you know scientific racism critiques so that's one foundation and then there's this other foundation which is sort of like all the art tactics right <laughs> all the kind of visual communication experiential you know kind of cultural activist practices mm -hmm. And I guess, I mean, you did a great job of sort of giving us a sense of kind of where it led, but I would love to hear a little bit more about how you actually design a course that sort of does, has, is able to create that groundwork mm. so that then these projects can be made and deployed and, and sort of what mm -hmm. that, yeah, just say a little bit more about that. I'm uh, either in that class or just in your teaching practice more generally. Yeah, sure. Um... I mean, you know, project based classes are a lot of work, you know, they're a lot of work for us, but they're a lot of work for the students also and it, it's a lot of work, not only in terms of the time they must put in. But also in terms of reconceptualizing how you learn, you know, and I think um, our students anyway get used to a certain mode, you know, there's a book, there's a test and you study for it you know and maybe you get the notes from lecture from a friend who went to class but maybe you didn't go or you know or you ask the questions in section of your tas but you know you're going to study for the test like at two in the morning the day of the test and that's not how building stuff works you know so i think um you know it takes them a while to recalibrate um, for some people in the class, it's the first time that they've been faced with um, a new story of the Americas, um, of the West, um, and it freaks them out a little bit. For other students, students of color, they, this is not the first time they've encountered this, and they're happy that finally there's a professor saying these things too. It's not just their family. Um, so. I think, you know, it's a nice mix usually in the class. It's usually majority, slight majority students of color in like 100 people, right? Um, so, you know, in the, when they're in their sections, they kind of talk about what, what they want to do, what group they want to be in, what kind of work they want to do. Somebody's an expert in something. Like every group revolves around people having either expertise in or desire to gain expertise in something so the 3d scanning was new to everybody you know i had a friend come in and help us with that and one of the students just got so captivated by it that he really just went around and did everybody and started editing stuff together and um you know the crania uh you know that group took a while to figure out what their traits were, you know, and so I told them like choose three colors and like four shapes or something and then we'll just mix, you know, you'll you'll mix them up, you'll decide how to mix them up. So they weren't telling me, they weren't telling me I was trying to go to Home Depot and buy spray paint, you know, and, then, and they were like, okay, we have the colors, red, white, and black. I was like, oh no, I was thinking something more abstract, <laughs> you know? But um, but it worked because of how they decided to do their traits, I think, you know, we just sort of came in with a bunch of sort of kid art supplies and they've had, what are those things called, the, the wires with the sparklies and... Pipe cleaners? Yes, pipe cleaners, thank you. And like pom-poms and felt and different kinds of things like googly eyes. Um, 
And that was fun because everybody got to get dirty for two weeks, you know, two weeks in the middle of the semester, we take the time that are like maker weeks, basically, you know, not quite the middle, slightly after the middle of the semester, where they can just delve in and that's the homework, you know, basically is making and developing the thing, doing the research, whatever it was, you know, and, um, you know, once they, once they uh, decide that this is not a normal class, and um, most of them do decide that at some point, then they get into it. But I think it wasn't until the last two weeks of class when we got into the gallery and they started mounting things that they really were like, oh, wow, yeah, my work is actually in an art gallery, you know, and they were starting to paint the walls and do all of the, the stuff. Um, then they, they, then it became real, I think, in a different kind of way. Similarly with the website, um, once it was up, I sent it around to the conference um, presenters because they had all been interviewed by the students at that point. And, you know, they were totally excited and they were sending us feedback and Laura sent actually quite long feedback. And so I would send it to them and they got very excited. You know, I think next fall we're going to do maybe an annotation project, like take some of the classics and have them annotate like what's what's not there that should be there or what what connections they might make between spaces and have some of my colleagues in the AAA come and comment on their comments or something like that. You know, because I think if they do something publicly in the world, they're responsible for it in a different kind of way. And then they don't want to they don't want to just like slap off a paper. You know, they want to actually um, make it meaningful, you know, show their mom when they're there picking them up for the winter break or whatever. Yeah. Did Thank I answer you. your question? Yes, I mean, absolutely. I should say also, like, yeah. I have a lot of help, you know, I have yeah. TAs who are like, super engaged. And for this particular project, we worked with one of my graduate students who like knows everything about casting, you know, and so he was the one who was really doing our faces and organizing that whole um, project, which was fun for everybody, including me. Yeah. Thank you, Deborah. Um, so, you know, it, it's especially it's really helpful to hear about, you know, the the labor of teaching, but also just, you know, the intentionality behind it, because there's also so much education running through this space. And mm -hmm. so really just appreciate your contributions tonight in general. And, and thank you for your time. Well, We're thank you. All. So thank you to Deborah. And um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Yeah. Um, so this will wrap up our first full day of the conference, um, but want to remind you uh, about Museum Day tomorrow. We'll meet here at more, I think it's at 9 a.m., right? At nine. Um, and then you can sign up for your tours if you haven't already. And if you have, then you'll, you'll figure out uh, where, where you're going. Um, and then also just want to make a plug that you, um, if you want to keep hanging out tonight, that there's, it's a lovely night, and there's a couple of bars that have some nice outdoor areas, which is, you know, certainly a pleasant thing in this moment. And so I would recommend down the parkway, if you just walk towards City Hall, you'll hit two of them. One is called Urban Farmer, and the other one is a rooftop called Victory Brewing. So just, you know, find your people and, and end up over there and hope you have a good night and uh, get home safe. And thanks again to Deborah for closing us out tonight. Yeah, appreciate it so much. Yeah. All right, have a good night, everyone. Yeah.